afternoon, David, and uh, <laughs> I have to say that you're in Seattle, so it is, well, it's afternoon here in Virginia, so uh, on behalf of the Virginia Soil Health Coalition and For the Soil, we're happy to have D David Montgomery with us. He and his wife, Ann Bickley, are the authors of a recent book, What Your Food Ate, and David and Ann also were keynote speakers at the 2018 Virginia Farm to Table Conference, and just wanted to take this opportunity to talk to David about the different, the four different books that uh, he and Anne have written around soils and soil health. So I'm uh, very glad to have this opportunity to talk with you this afternoon. Well, Eric, I, I thank you. I appreciate being here and talking with you again. Mary, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you as well. And uh, yeah, happy to talk about the books. Uh, it's been an interesting journey in thinking about soil and, and its relationship to people and societies and, and now our own individual health. And David, I, I, you know, we, we have different, I have a degree in history, actually from James Madison University. And if you could talk a little bit about your background with uh, geomorphology and soil science, but I think just giving people an idea of your own both personal as well as professional uh, journey, that'd be helpful. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, it's, I, I had never thought when I was in college that I'd be writing books about soils and the relationship to human societies because I started off as a biology major, ended up going into geology, uh, which fascinated me and got into uh, geomorphology, which is the kind of geology that focuses on the the processes that shape the surface of the earth. So 100 years ago, I might have been called a physical geographer or a topographer. I could still be called a physical geographer. It's, it's, it's a great discipline. Um, and that geomorphology really sort of uh, is the here and now of geology. And I've really enjoyed looking into other fields like agronomy, like uh, soil science, like human health. In part, I think, because geomorphology is a fundamentally um, synthetic and interdisciplinary um, field. And what I mean by that is that, you know, to understand what shapes the surface of the earth, you not only have to understand the geology, but you have to understand the soil, you have to understand the plants that grow in a landscape and, and you know, uh, that help move soil around or hold it together on steep hillsides. You need to understand climatology and how that works. And so there's, there's all these other fields that come into play. And you have to understand physics and chemistry is foundational to understanding all those other things. Um, and so I've been fascinated for a long time about how different areas of what we normally think of as discrete disciplines kind of overlap in ways where you need to understand a bit out of both fields to, to really put the real big picture together. Uh, and that's been a, a, a big part of the fun of writing books, um, of writing the four books that you've got up on the screen, um, because they're, they're synthetic works in the sense of pulling together a lot of what other people have done in research and trying to make sense out of it at the next level up from individual studies. In, in David, on that on that point, and in, in speaking to to history and um, the the intersectional nature of science and history, looking at your first book, Dirt: um, The Erosion of Civilizations, what inspired inspired that to to start this journey off? I guess. Well, you know, the, the real backstory to that is that when I was an undergraduate uh, studying geology, um, the bookstore at the university I was at always had a bargain bin. Um, and given that I was not one of the richest students on campus, <laughs> um, you know, I, I bought my um, pleasure reading from the bargain bin. And, and one, one year, there was a book called Topsoil and Civilization by Vern Carter and Tom Dale, if I'm remembering their names right, two soil conservation service scientists who wrote the book in the 50s in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl. And their basic argument was that the way that people treated land and the soil erosion in particular had affected the course and fate of past societies. And, um, you know, my working on dirt was an attempt to essentially update their view of things because uh, we'd learned a lot since then. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff they didn't really touch on. And I recommend their book is great. It's wonderful. It's been out of print a long time. Um, but you know, just long enough to be in the bargain bin when I was an undergrad. Uh, and it, it really influenced my thinking as a geology major to think that, oh, wow, this soil stuff, you know, that my professors are telling me is underburden, I'm, I'm sorry, overburden, the stuff you don't really want to know about, uh, that you want to clean off to get to the rocks so you could really look at deep earth history. 
uh, you know, reading that book, it really informed me that, wow, this stuff is actually really important for human societies over time frames that are, you know, span human history. Um, and so the, the way we've taken care of the soil is really sort of one of those things that, that connects the human time scales uh, that we tend to look at in history and the geologic time scales when we look at the history of a landscape. And that confluence, that overlap really fascinated me. Um, and so, you know, I had written a book about the environmental history of salmon as the first book that I wrote in terms of popular science uh, books called King of Fish, The Thousand Year Run of Salmon. Because I was working on salmon recovery and rivers in the Northwest at the time and, and got really interested in that because you can't, you can hardly step foot in a river in the Northwest without knowing, you know, seeing salmon at the right time of year. And when it came to write a follow-up book for that, since it, it sold well enough that a publisher was interested in a second book, um, I was like, oh, what do I do? And I was like, oh, I'll update that Carter and Dale book. So I spent a you know, year and a half or so, two years digging into all that history. And I, I frankly, I got carried away because the history part was so fun and so interesting. And the story in society after society ended up seeming to have a common thread to it in terms of how we treated land affecting the way that our descendants are able to prosper on land or not. Um, and that opened the door to thinking about soils in a new way that, you know, you can see in the covers of those books, I sort of kept going. And Anne is a biologist. And so when you look at geology and biology, you know, the, the coupling of that is essentially um, soil science or soil. So it was natural that at some point we start, would start working together on it. And there's a whole backstory to that as well, but getting into it, you know, the origin story is, is really thinking about um, the work that flowed out of the Soil Conservation Service back in the 30s and got written up in the 50s, republished as a paperback in the 70s, and ended up in the Stanford bargain bin in the, in the early 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and David, uh, you know, reflecting on your, your book, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, a, a book that I've have returned to at different times is Timothy Egan's The Worst Hard Times. I, mm. Whenever I'm sort of down or depressed, I have to read that to realize how difficult the, both the Great Depression as well as the Dust Bowl was. But in your book, you go back in history and look at different civilizations and you think about the Fertile Crescent, the Tiger Euphrates River system and what happened to that. Uh, can you Talk a little bit more as to how you went about looking at different civilizations. Yeah, you know, I had when I started writing the book, I had these grand fantasies of traveling all over the world and, you know, and looking at archaeology and, and things like that. And what I ended up doing is mostly going to the library because uh, <laughs> it was a deep dive into historical sources. So, you know, for looking at um, the, the, the stuff in the Middle East, the early Middle East, the origins of agriculture, I would go and basically research all the books I could find that anthropologists and archeologists had written about the origins of agriculture. Um, and then try and put together, extract from that, the pieces of the story that were relevant to the story I was trying to put together, which was how did the way people treat the land actually influence then what happened? Um, and it was fascinating to dive down those those areas. Um, and so, you know, when it came time to look at, say, uh, the, the story in classical Greece, I'd basically go to the archaeology literature, read everything I could there, but also dive into the actual, you know, Greek geographers from, you know, the, from the BC era and what they knew and what they thought and, and who noticed that erosion was happening and how it was fascinating to see that they commented at the time about you know rivers that had been cleared of forests and were aggressively farmed and tilled had big deltas of of of, of silt and mud building out from the mouths of the rivers into into the Mediterranean, where whereas the watersheds that were still native forest lacked these big deltas, um, and so there were some very interesting and observant people back in those days. Who's if you go back and kind of read their original stuff. Um, and you can pull out bits from different philosophers and and start to put together the story of well, sort of the who knew what, where, when kind of a deal. Um, and that was a lot of fun to look at in researching those books. But I, let a, I read a lot of the archaeology literature because that's where a lot of descriptions of soils actually are in the scientific literature that would pertain to those earlier times. Um, and it's, it's rich with examples and really interesting. Um, but what I found partly is that people in, um, that had studied different civilizations in the past around the world, even though many had come to similar conclusions about sort of what the way that we, the farmers had treated soil meant for subsequent generations, 
there was a real lack of stepping back and doing a global overview of, oh, okay, well, if the story is like this in the Med in the, around the Mediterranean in Greece and Rome and like that in, in in the Nile and the Tigris and Euphrates and a different way in Southeast Asia, but there's this common thread running through it. I sort of viewed that as the, the aha part for me in terms of framing the story was realizing the common thread that ran through it all. And I know that different areas are all unique and they have their own story and, and interesting part of history. But what I wanted to basically make the case for is that the way we treat land it essentially sets the stage for how history plays out. And David, thinking then into that transition to growing a revolution is it's particularly interesting to me because, you know, here you have the erosion of civilizations and that common thread of, you know, not necessarily downfall, but um, demise and then really growing a revolution with the hope it's this new narrative of hope in what farmers are doing on the land um what what inspired in that transition yeah that 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 was that's been a very pleasant transition to go from writing a very depressing book about history societies in the past to, to writing a fairly optimistic book about the potential of regenerative agriculture to solve the problems that i wrote about in the dirt book and sort of that the 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 journey to get to the point where I could write Growing a Revolution really had sort of two major inspirations. And one of them was Anne's garden, basically what she did in our yard in Seattle that we wrote about in the hidden half of nature, that when I was finishing writing uh, dirt, um, you know, cataloging the 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 undermining of societies in the past from from the degradation of soil and soil fertility and and from soil erosion. Uh, she was basically terraforming our yard, which had horrible crappy soil when we bought the place, into a really lush garden with rich soil. She took it from about 1% organic matter up to about 10% organic matter in our soil over the course of about a decade. And the life that just sprung out of the yard and her efforts as a gardener um, were really impressive at turning around that problem of soil degradation at a pace that was, you know, to a geologist was darn near instantaneous, right? To basically completely reverse the kind of degradation that I'd been writing about societies had had um, uh, imposed on their land over generations and centuries. Here she was turning it around in a decade in our yard, right under my nose in the backyard. Um, so I couldn't help but notice. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I started to get invitations to talk at farming conferences about the dirt book. And at some of those conferences, uh, I would meet people like Gabe Brown and other farmers who had been sort of early adopters of what we would now call regenerative practices, people who had gone to no-till and then gone to cover crops and started diversifying their operations. And uh, I started, you know, I was at these conferences, had given my talk, then I'd listened to other farmers who were showing examples of how they had taken degraded farms and done what Anna did to, done to our yard but they'd done it on a full-scale operational farm. And so I started thinking, wow, I really ought to go and talk to these guys and, and interview them and ask, what did you do? And when I did, that formed the backbone for writing Growing Revolution because what I found is that many of the practices that they were adopting on their farms were philosophically aligned with what Anne was doing in our yard, that there were general principles that underpinned how you could revive the fertility and health of the soil. And that it didn't work only in a in a garden where you've got to start, you know, you've got coffee shops down the street to provide you with nitrogen rich coffee grounds for free after work and and arborists who will chip up wood chips and leave them in your driveway because they they need a place to dump them and they're happy to. Um, the idea that, that that regenerative practices could actually work on economically viable full scale farms was sort of the next revelation and eye opener. And that's the story we tried to tell in Growing Revolution, um, visiting farmers in Equatorial Africa, Central America, and across North America to look at both subsistence farmers and large scale industrialized North American farms. And you know, what I came away with was a very optimistic story in terms of how a different suite of practices under a philosophy of trying to rebuild soil health um, really could transform degraded land back into very productive land. And the part that really turned me into an optimist was in, in interviewing these early adopters who had done to their farms what Ann did to our yard. It turned out that they all told stories of becoming more profitable, more economically viable than their conventional neighbors because they reduced their fertilizer bill, they reduced their pesticide bill, they reduced their um, diesel bill. Um, and you know those are three of the biggest costs on a modern farm in the US and three of the real prohibitive costs for 
um, subsistence farmers in the, in the global south, when I sort of realized that these, these sort of new style of farming could work economically and be better for the environment, uh, that was really sort of the, the revelation that was like, wow, this, these ideas might actually catch on because they seem to work. And David, talking about the hidden half of nature and the mo microbial roots of life and health, uh, you could talk about, yeah, you know, we've had some different uh, well, colleagues as well as speakers on our podcast talk about, you know, mulching your gut and mulching the soil and you know, a good friend and colleague, Mike Phillips, talks about, you know, feeding the above ground as well as the below ground and as a soil scientist and geomorphologist you know how you have seen interest in microbial life and the biology of the soil and uh, the importance of it i found that intriguing in the book yeah that and that was you know the parallels between what goes on around the roots of a plant in the rhizosphere and what goes on in the human gut we're a total eye opener to both Anne and I um, in looking into the literature on microbial ecology in both systems. We again realize that there's parallels in terms of communication and defense and nutritional acquisition, uh, the roles that microbial life, mostly bacteria and fungi, play in supporting the host's, host organism's health, whether that's a plant or whether it's a person. It's kind of how nature works, it turns out. Uh, through partnerships between you know, the, the so-called higher life forms and, and microbial life. And it makes evolutionary sense when you look back in a geological perspective. I mean, we can look back at the earliest land plants, for example, and they formed partnerships with fungi to actually gain their nutrition. The original function of roots was mostly to hold plants up and to, to pull up uh, water, but not necessarily to um, provide uh, uh, nourishment. A lot of the... Um, well, anyway, the, the, the earliest fossil plants that we have evidence of had uh, fungal symbioses. Um, and so these are these are relationships that go back to the very dawn of the colonizing of continents. And you know, it's kind of mind blowing to think about what may have shaped the evolution of the human gut microbiome through our long evolutionary journey. But it's hard to avoid the conclusion that a lot of it was due to what we ate, because um, that's, that's how we were getting stuff into us. And so when you think about that, then you start thinking about connections between what's happening in the soil and what's happening within us. And there's there's different microbial communities around the roots of a plant and within the human gut. There's not a lot of overlap. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, most soils are aerobic environments. They're oxygen rich environments and our gut is not. Our gut is anaerobic. And so they're completely different habitats, kind of like, you know, the seas and the continents. So you'd expect different organisms to be in them. But the functions that they serve and the, the guilds, the types of functions that they serve are remarkably parallel. Um, but you just have to think about the root system of a plant and the interior of the human gut as the same thing inside out. Um, and so, you know, which uh, the plants essentially uh, uh, evolved to have those partnerships with microbes on the outside of their bodies and communicate through the roots. And we just we've evolved to take food into us support a microbiome in our gut that helps to transform that food into releasing nutrients, but also transforming things like fiber into compounds that benefit our health when our body then absorbs them. There's a lot of microbial metabolites, the products of my microbial metabolism that turn out to have very direct relationships to both crop health in the, the soil example and human health in the gut example. And so the, you know, the big revelation to us in writing The Hidden Half of Nature was how fundamental those relationships are and how seriously wrong modern agriculture has gotten it by essentially ignoring those relationships. And we've seen a lot of interest in soil ecology and soil biology develop over the last few decades and really take off in the last 10 years or so, um, in part because the science of understanding those relationships has really advanced uh, along with our ability to study microbial communities. It, I mean, imagine how hard it is to study something that's so small you can't see it. You don't even know, we didn't even know they existed until a few centuries ago. Um, and, and how would you study the ecological interactions of invisible microbes um, without having the kind of technology that we have today? So there's been a lot of scientific advances that really line up with some of the early insights of, of in particular, some of the organic um, agriculture pioneers in the 1930s and 40s who intuited 
many of the relationships that have been subsequently established. And they got a few of the details wrong, but they were on kind of the right track. Um, so I've forgotten what, where your original question started, so I should probably give you room to ask another one. <laughs> well, and I'd be interested, David, as you and Anne were writing The Hidden Half of Nature, was a lot of that research emerging at that time um, and just kind of what that process was like? Yeah, you know, the, um, the I still remember the time okay. when um, the whole sort of parallelism between the, the root and the gut uh, really became in, in sharp because we, when we were writing that book, um, there was a major change in our research halfway through because of a health challenge that, that Anne experienced that, that heightened our interest in what goes on to support the human immune system. And that got us into looking at the human gut and so on. And, and Anne and I were in a bar in Seattle um, one evening and uh, my band was playing at it. And so she was at the bar and uh, after the set, she came over and basically had sketched out she was doodling and drawing, you know, what the, the, the relationship of microbes and the root system and then the human gut. And she died these two doodles and she was like, these are the same thing, but inside out. And she was really excited about it. She had the initial aha and I sort of looked at her drawings and went, yeah, this actually makes a ton of sense. Um, so it was, it was a, it was a very interesting revelation at the time um, because it was not that well recognized back in 2015 when we were, when we were doing the, the heavy lifting on writing the book. Things were just coming out in the journals that started to provide the, the way to think about that and, and, and recognize the connections. And I'm not arguing we're the only people that recognize that initially. There were people in microbial ecology who, who were onto it. Um, but when we recognized that, it was like, wow, this is really cool. And that's how we then chose to organize things around that. And we literally, in writing that book, down to the wire of when it was due at the publisher, were looking at, you know, science and nature and the journals that were just coming out and going, you know, it was like every week there was a new study that was directly relevant to what we were writing about. Mm -hmm. um, and we finally had to agree that, okay, after like Friday night, no more studies. We are done. <laughs> we're sending the manuscript off to the publisher. And anything that comes in next week is just, you know, it's out of bounds. Uh, but we still managed to sneak some additional stuff in in the page proof stage where uh, our publisher doesn't like that. We're kind of guilty about trying to tweak it all the way to the last minute and, and keep trying to make it better. But, you know, that's kind of our job as writers. And David, I think one one of the chapters is uh, about microbes as allies. What would you uh, tell farmers or gardeners or landowners or ranchers? In, in thinking about microbes as allies. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of conditioned by the way we've thought about microbes for a long time to think of them as germs, as bad things, right? I mean, we all know that it's like, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, but it turns out that most microbes, you know, particularly in those systems of the human gut and around, in the, around the roots of the plants and soils, Are, they're either neutral, they don't benefit or, or not or harm a plant, or they actually provide a, a very beneficial service. And so and when you look at the raw numbers, the allies really outnumber the pathogens. There's only something like 1,200, if I'm remembering the numbers right, uh, identified human pathogens. And there are literally thousands and, or millions of different types of organisms in both environments. Um, and there's many of which have positive effects on the host. So, you know, in terms of advising farmers on how to think about microbial life, think of them as livestock. Think of them as, you know, as, as tiny, um, tiny livestock that inhabit your soil that if you feed them well and take care of them and herd them well, if you manage them well, uh, they can essentially work for you right? uh, by improving the aspects of the farm you would like, improving soil organic matter, improving yields, improving uh, crop health. But if you mismanage your livestock, they become a liability. Um, and that's where the, the overuse of nitrogen fertilizers, the overuse of uh, pesticides, uh, herbicides and insecticides can actually greatly impact the communities of life in the soil in ways that, that preferentially degrade the beneficial organisms. Uh, and I like to think about it in terms of if you have, um, you know, if you have a field, a freshly plow, uh, if you have a field and you plow it and you, then you don't plant anything yourself, what's going to come back first? Well, it's going to be weeds because you've created a disturbed system and weeds thrive in disturbed systems. Or if you think about um, 
that classic ecological experiment of you know what happens when deer swim to a remote island in Canada and, and take or moose or whatever and take up residence and then the wolves figure out there's deer on that island they come over there and start eating the deer you know the population of the deer starts to go up init up initially then the wolves arrive and the deer crash because the wolves eat all the wolves then what crashes next oh the wolves crash because they ate all the deer what comes back first after that? Well, it's not the predators. It's the it's the it's the prey that come back first. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar kind of thing with pests and pathogens, where if you look at uh, most farm fields, there's something like 1200 different um, in, uh, insect uh, eaters, predators in, in a typical uh, non pesticided farm field. Um, and there's a small number of pest organisms, but if you take out, if you apply a broad spectrum biocides, broad spectrum pesticides, you take everything out. Mm -hmm. So what comes back first? Not the predators. The prey comes back first, which means that if you're routinely spraying to keep a pest down, what you're doing is you're creating the perfect environment to invite that pest back to the table because you've eliminated everything that eats that pest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think if you think ecologically about managing the microbial life in the soil, it makes a lot more sense to have them as tiny livestock that are adding value to your farm rather than invisible enemies you're trying to defeat, but you can't because in trying to defeat them, you also take out the thing that manages them. Um, so th that's one perspective on it, um, that when you start thinking about the soil as an ecological system full of potential allies and potential pathogens, it starts to shape the way you would think to manage that so that you benefit the benefit, so you cultivate the beneficial organisms and you try and preclude opportunities for the pests and pathogens. And it turns out that, you know, one of the best ways to preclude opportunities for pests and pathogens is to have soil that's, you know, rich with life forms that literally take up the space that the pathogens might occupy or eat the pathogens um, and thereby manage them at low enough numbers that they may still be there, but they're not much of a problem. Mm -hmm. so, that's how I would encourage farmers to think about their microbial life as, as tiny livestock. And then just to think from a, a human connection, I know occasionally if you, you know, have an infection and you go to see your family doctor that, uh, you know, if, if they have to prescribe a course of antibiotics, now it's very common to also encourage you to, you know, eat yogurt or other mm -hmm. type of probiotic to, increase the the beneficial you know microbes in your gut as well so it's interesting to see the different connections that are being made to human health as well yeah and there's some and there's interesting applications in agriculture for the idea of probiotics in terms of microbial inoculants uh, particularly reintroducing fungal species that may have been uh, depressed or eliminated by conventional uh, farming practices over the last century or so because when you think about a microbial community, you know, it's not necessarily uh, good enough to just build it and let them come. If they're no longer in the soil, you might need to reintroduce them. But then once you have, and the same thing with probiotics in the human body, it's, it, you know, unless you want to just like keep adding those probiotics all the time, you need to set the conditions up for those organisms to actually thrive and, and persist. And so the ideal way would be to introduce probiotics, whether whether in back into a person or into a farm field, and then establish the conditions that would allow those organisms to maintain the beneficial relationships with uh, life forms. I lost uh, I lost the ability to digest milk for a while in my twenties. I had, had uh, got jardy in Mexico from drinking well water that it was pretty dumb, but um, but I did anyway. Um, and it took a couple years of taking probiotics to actually reintroduce uh, uh, the bacteria that would would help you know the um, uh, the lactose uh, uh, metabolizing bacteria or that could help with that. But it worked. It just took a while to maintain it. Um, and so that's where, you know, having the right organisms and the conditions to, for, to allow them to prosper are the ways to think about uh, really how to manage them. And so probiotics are an element that could have a lot of value in, in both medicine and in agriculture, but the basic maintenance practices and in the human body, it's what we choose to eat uh, in our farms and for the soil, it's how we choose to treat the soil, you know, whether we plow it, how much, for, how much of what kind of fertilizer do we add? Uh, what kind of herbicides or pesticides are being used. Um, those are all things that you could think of as setting the diet of the soil. Mm -hmm. and David, you're thinking of that gut 
um, root connection. At this point, you know, as the hidden half of nature came out, were you starting to see more interest from the medical health community? Um, yeah, we were starting to see, I mean, we were start that when at the time we were writing that there was starting to be a lot more interest in the medical community about the gut microbiome and the connections, you know, the gut brain axis and the connections and how your microbes are um, metabolizing uh, your food and that it's affect your immune system and your overall health. There was a lot of interest coming sort of uh, into focus right about that time. Um, and so we tried to, you know, surf on that and pull that all together as, as uh, the, the, the story of the parallels between what was going on in the soil and what was going on in the human gut. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot, we, I, we still have seen in the last, when that came out, it came out in 2016. So in the last six years, you know, there's been more science that comes out that just basically backs up the, the, the stuff that we wrote about in there. Um, the, the perspective, it seems to have legs. And David, you had talked about this a little bit and, you know, as part of For the Soil and the Soil Health Coalition promoting the four soil health principles of keeping soil covered, minimizing disturbance, maximizing living roots and energizing with diversity, with the different farmers that you worked with and visited in growing a revolution. Can you speak to how important it was to have a a suite of practices and combination of practices? It was the whole game. <laughs> you know, basically, uh, in visit the farmers I visited who were very successful at restoring fertility to the land uh, had come to that combination of practices, some of them slowly, starting off with no-till and then gradually getting into cover crops and then diversifying their cover crops and some reintegrating animal husbandry and livestock into, into their cropping operations as well as a, as a manure source. Um, but it basically found that, that they all had adopted a system that had all three of the all three of the uh, primary elements of no till or minimal disturbance, cover crops or keeping living roots in the plant uh, uh, in the soil at all times and growing a diversity of things. Um, and that applied ac across the board. Um, and then in digging into the, the scientific literature, what I basically found was that the the studies that people you, know, you look at these meta studies studies of studies where people go out and they gather every study they can they pull them all together to go what kind of sense can we make out of this usually using statistics um and what we basically found was that the studies that had looked at single practices whether it was no-till whether it was cover crops uh in particular uh that they would find that you know often there'd be benefits but not always so it wasn't a clear-cut case in terms of what was happening but when you got into many of those studies, uh, those meta studies, and you parsed the studies of, uh, you, you sort of read the details of the studies, the, the cases where farmers had adopted practices based on all three of those principles, or all four, depending on what, how, which way you want to count, um, they were the ones that consistently showed major improvements in things like soil organic matter, or crop yields, or, or soil health. Um, and I came away with with a convinced that it was the combination of practices that really was the key. It's not just going no till and calling it regenerative. That, that doesn't necessarily work. Not just doing cover crops. It was this different system that involved all of those elements. And I think the reason is actually probably pretty simple. And it goes back to microbial ecology, where if you think about what does minimal disturbance do? Well, it basically provides a stable substrate. Think about how disruptive it would be if if once a year someone took a giant spoon took the lid off your house and stirred up all your stuff <laughs> you know it's it, it, it's not it would be no way to live right it'd be horrible habitat um and so you think about what does a plow do to soil life it basically does that it's like a tornado striking every time that happens now a community can survive the occasional tornado strike but if it happens every year you're probably going to move um and then when you look at, so there's the whole, that whole aspect. And then there's essentially, you know, if you think about cultivating beneficial life, having enough to eat is basically a basic premise. You need habitat, undisturbed habitat, you need food, and that's where cover crops come in. Because if cover crops are to, uh, if a lot of the biomass that's produced from cover crops retains on the field, is retained on the field to then rot and, and be recycled with, with biogeochemical cycling, what those cover crops are doing is extracting mineral elements for plant from plants, extracting carbon from the atmosphere, bringing it into the biological world, and then that makes it available to the next organism that can take up the decayed products of that earlier life, again, recycled through the soil. So uh, the cover crops are feeding soil life, and diversity 
that's basically a, rep, a, a recipe for resilience um, and for uh, versatile functionality. Uh, the analogy I like to use there is think about a baseball team that was made up entirely of catchers. They're not going to win the World Series. They're going to, you know, they, they, no ball might get past home plate coming from a pit, you know, coming from the catcher that was drafted to pitch. Um, but the, the team's not going to do very well. Uh, diversity actually provides versatility in terms of different positions that can be covered. And the soil is no different from a baseball team in that regard. So if you have different crops putting out different exud uh, exudates, compounds, the crops exude from their bodies, from their roots to feed microbes, sort of the root of the, of the symbioses, the plants provide nourishment to the microbes. The microbes do things like provide mineral elements back to the plants, uh, and metabolize the, those nutrients that are put into the soil to make things like growth hormones that the plants take up to capture more solar energy so they can feed more microbes. You know, if you start thinking in those kinds of terms, that no-till cover crops and diversity translates into an abundance and, and a well-fed abundance and diversity of life in the soil, that means there's lots of potential allies in the soil. And the plants and the organisms can work out through those mutually beneficial relationships, which ones will thrive or not. Um, but when we degrade soil, we degrade, we lose topsoil and, and lose the organic matter from soil, those relationships start to fall apart. They start to fray and fall apart because you're taking away um, either the, the habitat or the food or the partners. Um, so it, you know, when you start looking at it through this microbial ecology lens, uh, a lot of this starts to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And David, when we're talking about kind of building up that microbial life, what kind of time scales are are we looking at? Um, yeah, when 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 Ann was first working on our garden in her yard in Seattle, um, you know, it took you know probably two or three years before we really started noticing any change. And what we really started to notice was that the soil uh, we'd put in a patio when we bought when we uh, we stripped off an old lawn, put in a patio, started to make a garden. After a couple of years of composting and mulching and 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 um, uh, uh, organic matter additions to the to the soil, um, we started to notice that the soil was a little darker um, and that it was rising up a little bit above the patio. It was fluffing up. Um, so it was uh, and. That was right when I was finishing writing dirt. And so when we started to notice that, hey, I think the soil's a little darker, we started to dig a few holes. And so we went to some of the places on the property where we had not done much in terms of organic matter, sort of like the little overhang underneath the front window that never gets any rain and is just as bad a soil as it was when we bought the house. And you know, we dig it up, look at it, and go, wow, this is getting darker. And that was just a couple of years. That was a lot of what motivated us to look into soil microbial life because we started wondering, well, how did this happen? Um, and you know, we were we were adding the organic matter, composting, mulching, mostly to try and keep moisture in the ground because uh, we ended up planting foolhardily in the in August, which even in Seattle is not a good move. Um, but when we started seeing these changes and have it, had changes happening that fast, we started to really be interested in that question of what's the time frame. And so when I went through Growing a Revolution to interview farmers who had been asking these questions um, or, or doing these things on their own farms and starting to ask them, how long did it take you before you started to see a change? I was intrigued to see that, you know, many of them said, you know, yeah, just like a year or two, you start to see changes in the soil, you start to see it darkening. Um, and they, many of them argued that they basically uh, were starting to see economically positive returns on this after just a few years, two or three, four years is kind of the window that most of them that I interviewed were saying. And I've seen, I've talked with others since then who, who've argued that you could do it economic uh, with, without much of a loss in profit, you know, from the first year and others argue that it takes up to five years, but that window of just a couple years is really, you know, for a geologist like me, that's really fast. Um, the challenge, of course, is how do you actually help uh, get farmers through the period of transition where they may be running a risk of having you know, a lower yield um, and, and maybe not have completely cut their input costs to the level that they might be able to once they had restored fertility to their soil. Um, so I think a big challenge is, is, getting, uh, is in risk management during the transition. But the real opportunity there is that the transition, I think, can happen pretty fast. It can have a long tail, though. I mean, that it can take, you know, if you're trying to take a soil from 2% organic matter up to 6%, which would be a huge change in many parts of the world and hugely beneficial, 
That's not going to happen in just a couple of years. You could see progress in a couple of years, but it may take a decade or two to actually finish the story. And David, building on that thought, like here in Virginia, we have very old soils. And also, you know, if you look at the history of growing crops like tobacco or others that we've suffered a lot of erosion. And so maybe the topsoil has eroded off. And if you could just speak to the sort of the difference between geological formation and then managing to build topsoil. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a lot of the Piedmont areas uh, in the, the American Southeast, the topsoil has literally been lost through colonial farming and subsequent uh, modern agriculture. And the few farms, a few farms I've been on in that area, I mean, you look at the soil and it's the subsoil at the surface and high yields are maintained, not because of the fertility of the land, but because of a lot of the, the elements that are added to it. Uh, in terms of trying to rebuild the fertility of the soil, I mean, if you go or rebuilding soil, if you go, if you look at like the USDA's uh, um, uh, websites, they'll argue it takes 500 years to 1,000 years to build an inch of soil. And that's a pretty good estimate if you're starting from scratch, if you're starting from rocks. But, you know, subsoil is not, is not, it's not rock. It's actually, it, it has been broken up and it can be rich in certain things and poor in other things. It's particularly poor in organic matter. Um, but it turns out that if you, uh, adopt practices that can rebuild the organic matter, which is mainly a process of managing the biology, um, you can bring the soil organic matter much faster than you can turn a, a hunk of granite into soil. You can you could turn a degraded land back into fertile land really fast because you still have the geology. What you don't have is the biology. And that was one of the big, um, uh, a big revelation for me in thinking about the time scale potential for soil restoration is that you know if we really had to recreate the world's topsoil from scratch by starting with 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 rocks and weathering them you know we're, we're talking centuries but if we can start with the the mineral part in place yeah you know, maybe somewhat degraded but there's 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 a lot of nutrients in most soils around the world even the sub even the subsoil many um, we can add the biology back really fast uh that that's a, some a process that can happen in years not centuries um, and that's what that's a big part of what turned me into an optimist on this is that if we can basically reorient modern agriculture to take account of the importance of soil biology and soil ecology as foundational to rebuilding and maintaining fertility in a in a in the kind of post oil world that we may be approaching this century, in which case you know the use of diesel and the use of nitrogen as a fertilizer source are going to be you know weaned out over the next hundred years for mo if if only for climate purposes um you know how do we maintain fertility in that new world that's coming well it's the same way that we would rebuild the health and fertility of our land today and put more carbon in the ground which will help us with the climate problem down the road as well mm -hmm. and do we go into what your food ate it what was, yeah, the transition from Hidden Half of Nature into that like? Because it seems like there's the natural kind of connection with, um, from those two. Yeah, I mean, when, when we ended up uh, getting through with the, the, other th the first three books, the, we real Anne and I realized that the topic that we had really left sort of on the table was, okay, what do regenerative farming practices mean and soil health mean for human health? We'd looked a lot at the health of the land. We'd looked a lot at the role of microbial life and the parallels of, the, of what's going on in our, in our bodies with what's going on in the soil. But we hadn't really looked at the direct connections between soil health and human health. Uh, and so that's what we tried to do with What's Your Food Ate. There's uh, a lot of people have talked about those connections, you know, since literally the 1930s when people like J.I. Rodale and uh, Eve Balfour in England and Sir Albert Howard in England were writing about uh, how the health of the land ripples up into the health of people. Um, and so we basically wanted to, to look into that and go, okay, a lot of science has happened since the 1930s. Um, and particularly in our understanding of microbial ecology, how has that played out? So we basically organized the book into looking into how does farming practices affect soil health? How does soil health affect crop health? How does soil health and crop health influence livestock health and the diet of livestock? How does that influence livestock health? And then how does that all roll up into influencing human health? Um, and that was, uh, you know, you can think of it like trying to uh, string together beads on a string where 
most scientific projects focus fairly narrowly on something, in part because that's what you can get money to get a student to do. You can get funding for it. You can survive the review of your peers for a proposal if you're not trying to do everything all at once. So most, most studies are, are fairly narrow in focus. Um, but if you look at how those studies connect together, the one from the other, from, the, from farming practices to the soil to crops to livestock to people, um, you, can, you can chart a path that is credibly defensible uh, connecting soil health to human health. And that's essentially what we tried to do in the book is to uh, look into what those connections are, how they work, but, and how this, what studies have actually looked at those connections. And they, you know, we came to the conclusion that there, you, can, you, can, you can draw that thread all the way through with pretty sound science. And it looks like you know, the kinds of things that modern farming practices can affect in a great way that end up affecting our diet and therefore our health are things like the provisioning of vitamins and mineral micronutrients in crops. You know, soil life turns out to be really important for that. Um, things like the, the provisioning of phytochemicals, chemicals that plants make for their own health and defense, often in response to stimuli from soil life or, or, or even uh, herbivorous insects, um, and, and how uh, those phytochemicals, when they get into our bodies, serve as antioxidants and anti-inflammatories that benefit our health. Uh, and then also how the diet of what we feed livestock, whether they grow, on, whether they feed on uh, uh, li the living photosynthetic parts of plants, grasses and leaves and brush, uh, or whether they're being fed seeds in, in a feedlot through its end, or seed derived feeds in a feedlot, really influences the, the fat composition in our meat and dairy products in ways that can influence the uh, inflammation. And the short answer to that is that seed products are rich in omega-6 fats, which are essential for triggering inflammation. And um, the photosynthetic parts of plants, the green parts of plants, the living parts of plants are really rich in omega-3 fats, which turn out to be central to helping to quell inflammation. And you want inflammation to be able to work in your body. You mentioned, I think, a cut earlier. If you, know, if you cut yourself in the kitchen, you want inflammation to attack the microbes that are getting into your body. So you want your body to be able to mount a robust defense. But you need it to turn off in the end. And that's what omega-3 fats actually help facilitate, particularly complex omega-3s that are, that are present in meat and dairy that have been fed, that are, that are grass-fed. So the mix of fats, phytochemicals, and mineral micronutrients are all things that uh, we were able to show, that other studies have shown that we swept together into the book can influence uh, what's in the human diet, thereby connecting how the way we treat the land and our crops and our livestock influences our health. But, you know, Part of the issue there in terms of recognizing it is that when we look at soil health, we're not just talking about conventional versus organic agriculture. We're talking about practices that build soil health. And in both conventional and organic agriculture, there are practices that can help build soil health and there's practices that degrade soil health. So it's sort of a third dimension, if you will, in thinking about it that affect these three things, micronutrients, phytochemicals, and the fat balance in livestock. Um, but those things all relate to the management of chronic diseases in people um, when we integrate that into our diet. Um, so it's, and the, and the nutritional field has traditionally looked at nutrients as things we need to stay alive, not necessarily the things we need to thrive. Um, and that's where, you know, you look at the, the major element composition of a tomato and, and yeah, farming practices probably aren't going to influence that all that much. In terms of the, the lycopene or the phytochemicals that are in that tomato, they have a huge effect on it. And that can then translate over into effects on the, on the human body when they, we integrate that into our diet. David, we really haven't touched on policy, but I know in Growing a Revolution, you talk about maybe how policies can speed up the adoption or adaptation of some of these practices and principles. And you know, we're also you know, trying to address sort of multiple goals with soil health and you know, ranging from, you know, how do we increase soil fertility, maintain water quality or quantity, uh, feed the world, address issues of, you know, diet related chronic illnesses, uh, store carbon, address issues of resilience and resistance to climate change, and uh, also the issue of the loss of habitat and diversity. You know, having written these and researched these four books. If you have thoughts on policy, we'd love to hear that. 
Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's been, it's been, you know, essentially agricultural policy in the U.S. since the Second World War to uh, encourage and subsidize farmers to grow a whole lot of very few things. Um, and that has really shaped a lot of modern agriculture. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of influences through agricultural subsidies and policies that can affect what farmers will grow. Uh, farmers need to be able to sell what they grow to stay in business. So we need to have markets for things. So there's a lot of things that could be done to on the policy level that could encourage farmers to adopt more regenerative practices through the way we think about uh, uh, subsidies or, or programs. Uh, in terms of like crop insurance programs, it was long very difficult to uh, get crop insurance. Oops, me... That should not happen. <laughs> um, but it was it's long been very difficult to get it. It was it was long difficult to get crop insurance uh, when you're using cover crops. Uh, that has started to change, which is really good. But when you think about you know what we're incentivizing farmers to do, that's where I think the, or incentivizing them not to do. That's where the policy connections really come in. Um, and that one of the key things I'd love to see would be more attention to how to actually minimize the risk for farmers when they transition from conventional to regenerative agriculture, because that can be a barrier to establishing that. And, you know, I think that if you look, if you take the society wide view, uh, there's strong reasons to argue that we should be encouraging farmers across the board to adopt more regenerative practices, to put more carbon in the ground, to put better food on our tables, all that kind of stuff. But we need them to stay in business to do it. And if they perceive that it's a risky business decision to go that route initially, that won't help. So I'd love to see more attention on the policy level to how we could craft policies that could actually help facilitate and minimize the risk in the transition. Um, we all, I would also love to see uh, 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 crop breeding programs nationally be revitalized to think about how to breed crops for high performance, high yield in regenerative systems. You know, we've bred crops for the last 80 years for high yields in conventional systems, um, and that's been very successful. But we haven't done that for organic and regenerative systems, and yet there's a whole lot of, I think, genetic potential in, our, in the genome of our crops to actually benefit that so we could maintain high yields and get um, uh, a better nutritional profile, better micronutrient and phytochemical profile and things. So there's a lot of areas that, that could be worked on there. Um, but I think when you think of it, the way to think about it is to think about it through what incentivizes farmers and how do you essentially align the incentives our society is giving them, whether it's on prices or whether it's on subsidies or whether it's on regulations. And I'm not a big fan of regulations. People don't like to do things when they're told they have to. They like to do things when they think they should. Um, and that could be through a different philosophy of farming or through incentives that help them do things that they would like to do better. Um, I don't think we'll ever get every farmer in the world, let alone North America, to, to adopt regenerative practices today. Uh, there's going to be time of adoption where more people convert. Um, but I think if you let it go over time, more and more farmers will become more regenerative, in part because it works out better for them economically. And I think when I, when I visit colleges and, and talk to uh, people, uh, young people in, um, in academic study these days, there's a lot more people interested in soil health and regenerative agriculture than there were 10 or 15 years ago. And I think we'll see growing interest in promoting that across the board as new generations of farmers come forward to take, take over from um, uh, older generations. Oh, thank you so much, David. Yeah, thank you, David. And I know we're running out of time here. So just, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all this information um, about the books and, and your knowledge and experience. But any final words, words of wisdom or information on where, where folks can get the books or access more resources? Uh, sure. You know, it's been a pleasure talking to you both too. Appreciate the opportunity and the conversation. And, um, you know, uh, what your, what your food ate uh, came out in June, uh, it should be orderable through any bookstore or online thing. Uh, all of the books, what your food ate, growing revolution, the hidden half of nature and dirt. They're all available on audiobooks as well. If people like to drive around and listen to books, um, or drive your tractor and listen to books. Um, the, um, and you know, whether you like to get them from Amazon or your local independent bookstore, that's entirely your choice. But pretty much anywhere you can get a book, uh, you should be able to order them from there. If you want signed books, uh, our website is uh, dig2grow.com, D-I-G, the number two, G-R-O-W.com. 
Um, and if, if people want to get in touch with either Anne or I and ask us questions, uh, you know, inquire about uh, uh, speaking opportunities, get signed books, I would encourage you to do that through the website. That's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos out there about of Anne and I both talking about um, about you know various elements of the individual books as well. Um, so that's a good resource as well. Um, but yeah, the, these these books really kind of chart the evolution of our thinking from going to look at how societies have degraded land in the past and that has boomeranged on their descendants to really turning around to a very optimistic look forward about how reforming agricultural practices is, can not only help us heal the land, but it can also help with human health, particularly in the management of chronic diseases through uh, provisioning of, of foods that are better suited for supporting our bodies. Thank you so much, David, and please uh, uh, give our greetings to Anne. We're sorry that she couldn't join us, but we just uh, have enjoyed the conversation and your insights and sharing about the evolution of the four books. And we would certainly encourage everyone to read them and continue to grow as students of soil health. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.